Hmm. Hey, Cypher here. In recent historiography, it's been easier and easier to classify all scholarship into three camps. Orthodox, revisionist, and post-revisionist. This is the result of the biggest change that has happened in the history profession throughout the last century, and it has significantly affected everyone in the Western world. This is going to be super meta, so understand, I cannot get into specific historical theories, just illustrate the huge change that has happened in history. It's not as though historians just suddenly started arguing with each other. Trust me, they've been arguing since before the profession was created. There are divides in the way we consider history going back millennia, but nothing as contentious as what I am describing now. You see, there was a trend until well after World War II where historians tried to portray the past as glorious or admirable in some way. They trumpeted the triumph of the greatest characters of our collective story. Of course, there was significant discord and many historians did not fit such an overly broad conception. But that trend held true. These historians created a triumphal narrative that is called the orthodox perspective. They formed the first narratives and arguments made about any given subject in history, and normally sought to do it some sort of honor in the description therein. After all, orthodox simply means the the standard accepted ideology. Much of this was affected by the rise of nationalism, and historians played into that by making their histories fit the nations, showing how great their particular nation was in the process. Well, the orthodox method remained popular until after World War II. The Cold War began bifurcating the world into different ideological camps. There had always been an undercurrent against orthodoxy, like Marxists or internationalists, but they were far less popular compared to the nationalists that made up orthodox history. But with the bifurcation, people had to be sharply divided as waves of anti-communism swept the Western world. This remained at a simmer until the mid-1960s. At that point in time, several events made the people who were being pushed aside by anti-communism become the new ideological forefront. First, the Civil Rights Movement achieved its primary goal in 1964, and subsequently splintered into factionalism. That same year, the Vietnam War began in earnest. As a result of the anti-racism and anti-war sentiments, toward the end of that decade, the counterculture rose in full force. The counterculture was not merely a bunch of hippies singing Kumbaya, of course not. The protests gave rise to the rediscovery of the undercurrent against orthodoxy that had been below the surface. The student movement that came with the counterculture reshaped scholarship as we know it. They sought to root out racism that forced the civil rights movement to come into being and the belligerent nationalism that had made the Vietnam War happen. Peace and equality became the calling card of these students, looking at race, class, and gender issues to ride alongside this current. As the students who were part of the counterculture matured into the historical profession, they brought their ideals along. These scholars sought to find the history where they could highlight the injustices of the past and point out guilt, especially if it showed the abuse of power. Instead of trumpeting people's triumphs, they sought to uncover race, class, and gender issues that showed that the triumphal past was wrongdoing. Ultimately, the project was to uncover how orthodox narratives had allowed belligerence and bigotry to rule history and correct what had been wrong. Of course, this new form of scholarship came under fire from the orthodox view. People were livid. They saw every new interpretation as an attack on the very character of their nation. And in some ways it really was. Nationalism was what supported the orthodoxy, and now the orthodoxy was under fire. So the people who were against the new trend belittled it as revisionism, because they were adamant that these scholars were putting their cause before trying to find the truth. That may be somewhat of the case, but the same may be said about the orthodoxy. Now, there had been historical movements called revisionist before, like New South Revisionism, where people seek to glorify the Confederacy's cause during the Civil War. But this is unrelated. Because of the negative connotation, revisionists might want to be called the New Left, because their history is the back 
writing of the political movement of the New Left, but that's not really used in historiographic terms. Revisionism and orthodoxy fought each other in a series of very publicized debates over any number of subjects. It came to be called the Culture Wars because it was a fight about every country's national identity. Our history is what defines us, because it is the story of us. People inherently know this, and they fought over revisionism tooth and nail. You could see it manifested in all forms of art, be it painting, music, movies, or whatever. This is where people started complaining about how the left is trying to take over our interpretation, as in the culture wars. At the heart of the culture wars was the fight between orthodoxy and revisionism. The easiest example of this is the endless debate over what caused the Cold War. And I'm only talking from a Western perspective, because if you talk about the Soviet perspective, this gets really confusing really quickly. The Orthodox school looks at the USSR as the aggressor state. After World War II, Stalin violated the Yalta Conference and dropped the Iron Curtain on Europe. Revisionists argue that it was warranted given Western policies that hurt any diplomacy and maltreated the Soviets, leading to their eventual betrayal after World War II. It's kind of like when a fight breaks out, and then afterwards everybody's arguing over who threw the first punch. Especially when no one had any idea as to who threw it. Then the whole argument degenerates into who pushed whom first. The same thing happened in regards to the Cold War, where paper after paper was being published demonizing the US or demonizing the USSR. Both arguments have their merits, but you can see how petty it got. And this is just one example. This rivalry between revisionism and orthodoxy degenerated quickly into ridiculousness. For instance, there was a strain of revisionism called negationism. This is in the same line of logic that postmodernism tries to affect history. Rather than seeking to build new scholarship, its sole purpose is to show how bad the evidence is in some way and refuse accurate accounts otherwise. Essentially, they're just trying to poke holes in arguments. But it has also taken on a more nefarious method, like Holocaust deniers, which are, in fact, revisionist negationism. So I guess it's like the Ouroboros of revisionism coming back to bite its own tail. Well, after a couple decades of revisionism being the biggest force in history, a new scholastic tendency came along. In response to the partisanship of either side, these historians sought to unite the most favorable elements of both sides and negate the problems. The easiest way to describe these historians is to say, understand, but do not judge. They sought to find, through evidence, the answer to questions without any specific judgment to be rendered. They took the belief in evidence before interpretation from the orthodoxy, and the seeking after new narratives that may be irreverent or contradictory from the revisionists. But never do they prescribe one perspective or another as the correct one, and let the reader decide what is right or wrong. These historians are called post-revisionists. Their hallmark is nuance and ambiguity. I would like to think of myself in this particular camp. It's difficult not to render judgment, though. Sometimes we want to vilify people or glorify others, but understanding them should be the primary goal. So, in the example of the Cold War's causation, for post-revisionists, this somewhat misses the point. Instead of assigning blame for the aggressor, they seek the roots of the issue. For instance, many historians now speak of the Russian intervention of 1918 through 1920 as the beginning of the Cold War, or they seek to highlight the growing tensions and misdeeds between the West and Russia from before World War II and even during, without choosing which side is the correct one. It's a middle ground and it's very hard to keep. As such, post-revisionism has been a long time in overtaking revisionism. It will happen someday, but historians have to stop being so judgmental. So in quick review, orthodoxy is nationalistic and triumphant, forming the standard narrative. Revisionism undermines orthodoxy by vilifying those in power through exposing their race, class, and gender problems. Post-revisionism seeks an ambivalent middle ground where ambiguity and nuance stop pre-rendered judgment. It's very easy to look at any historiography and just kind of plop the historians in it into these three camps. 
You can see how these scholastic trends have affected everyone today. They inform our politics and give them meaning. How we view the past changes the way we see ourselves. After all, history is the story of us.